Set apart a tithe of all the yield of your seed that is brought in yearly from the field. In the presence of the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose as a dwelling for his name, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, and your oil, as well as the firstlings of your herd and flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. But if when the Lord your God has blessed you, the distance is so great that you are unable to transport it, because the place where the Lord your God will choose to set his name is too far away from you, then you may turn it into money. With the money secure in hand, go to the place that the Lord your God will choose. Spend the money for whatever you wish, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, or whatever you desire. And you shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your household rejoicing together. As for the Levites, resident in your town, do not neglect them, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you. Every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year, and store it within your towns. The Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, as well as the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows in your towns, may come and eat their fill, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you undertake. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. This morning in my sermon, I'd like to uh, walk you through that very interesting passage from the book of Deuteronomy that describes the tithe in the biblical period. I'd like to talk a little bit about the importance of tithing and the sharing of our resources, and then uh, suggest a plan for how we might grow in our sense of discipleship. The passage from Deuteronomy that uh, Aaron just read for us paints a picture of the ancient practice of a tithe, but I suspect it paints a picture you weren't quite prepared to hear. That in the passage, the, the giving of one-tenth of the resources was not some dour act of separating um, ourselves from our treasure, but it was an act of sharing. That one was invited to bring a tenth of the produce of their field and of their flocks, to bring it to that place where God causes God's name to dwell, and when you get there, have a party. <laughs> Did you catch that? When you get there, have a party. Rejoice and celebrate and give thanks. That the giving of the tithe was a way in which the community called itself together, honored and celebrated the strong bonds that formed them and rejoiced, gave thanks, and celebrated. In fact, if the place where God has chosen God's name to dwell is too far from where you are, the encouragement is to take what you would have offered and sell it, turn it into cash, and put the cash in your pocket, and then travel to that place and take the cash out of your pocket and spend it and celebrate. At the core, the practice of tithing is a celebration of a community's values that those values might shine, that those values might enrich, and that those values would endure. The practice of tithing far is not so much about money as it is about what we love, what we value. 
A second part of the tithing teaching was to remind us to be inclusive of those around them. The Levites were the priestly group. They did not own land. They did not have flocks. So they were encouraged. We were encouraged to remember them and we were encouraged to be mindful of the poor and the alien, that they too might share in that joyful celebration, in that party. The tithe was not sending life's precious resources away from you. It was offering them to God and sharing them in celebration. I had been preaching for about 10 years before I understood Christian stewardship. And I've told you this story before and I'll probably tell you again. But I was sitting in the parking lot at Dunkin' Donuts in West Lebanon, New Hampshire, and I was listening to uh, Terry Gross on the National Public Radio program, Fresh Air. And she was interviewing Reverend Johnny Ray Youngblood. He was the pastor of St. Paul's Community Church in Brooklyn, New York. Youngblood was retiring after a long, fruitful uh, pastorate there in that city. And the church had accomplished great things. Reading from the website this description. Youngblood came to the church and turned it around from a dying institution to a thriving center for religious and community activity. The church had created a school and through innovative programs brought young black men back into the church. St. Paul's has also built housing in the area, replaced, replacing brothels and numbers joints. Upon this rock, the miracles of the black church by Samuel Friedman, that's the story of his ministry. So as Terry Gross and Johnny Gray Youngblood were talking, they described each of those ministries with, uh, and he described them with vitality and with fondness. And as he was checking, checking off all the things that the church had done, he mentioned the word stewardship. And Terry Gross was quite offended by that. She said, no, no, how could you possibly ask those people for money? How could you ask the poorest people living in the worst conditions of poverty for money? And uh, Johnny Ray Youngblood didn't skip a beat. He said, you know, Terry, the problem in Brooklyn is not a lack of resources. If you would take a walk with me, I could show you liquor store after liquor store doing a very brisk business. If you would take a walk with me to the street corners, you would find any drug available and there is prostitution, and there is gambling. So the problem, Youngblood said, is not the lack of money. Christian stewardship, he said, is moving the resources of a community away from destructive practices and toward life-affirming practices. That congregation had no trouble at all asking someone not to buy a bottle of vodka, but to help pay an oil bill. And that probably did more good for that person than harm. For young blood and the Christians of Brooklyn. Christian stewardship 
was moving money away from the brothels, where human sexuality is distorted, and to move the resources toward youth programming that would help young people understand God's good gift of human sexuality and find healthy ways of embracing that precious gift. For young blood and the Christians of Brooklyn two decades ago, stewardship was moving money away from the cruel and uncaring slumlords who made great profit on human misery and redirecting those resources through the church and through the government. That good, safe housing would be available. For young blood and the Christians of Brooklyn two decades ago, stewardship was moving money away from a narcotic obsession with chance that comes through gambling and teach an important message that personal discipline is a better pathway to financial security and inner peace than playing the numbers. Christian stewardship is moving the resources of a community out of destruction into life affirmation. There's a hymn in our hymnal, and the second verse says this. Through our nation's spent frustration, through the corridors of stress, May there move a kindlier wisdom. All may feel. All may bless. Tax and tithe are for a purpose. Shared to shield the poor and weak. Past the symptoms of our sickness. Let the voice of justice speak. Well, young blood and the Christians of Brooklyn two decades ago embraced those words with enthusiasm. But, but what of us? But what of us, we who dwell in the city of Concord that probably looks more like Mayberry than Brooklyn? What could we do? Or if there's a difference between us and them, maybe it's just a difference in examples. What could we do? How do our values impact and change moving resources from destruction to affirmation? I'm proud that we support three AA groups here in the life of our church. Sunday morning at 6.30, Monday night at 5, and Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. But there's something else I'd like to lift up. Every success that we achieve as a congregation speaks an important word. You see, we have chosen to be a reconciling congregation. We are one of the few United Methodist churches that has taken that stance. We have a banner to carry. And every success and every act of faithfulness is also a bold proclamation to a frightened denomination that the way of inclusivity is a way of vitality and not a step toward demise. We have a banner to carry. And I know that you're proud and grateful to carry that banner. Amen. Tithing is a challenge, though. No one 
tides accidentally, one person wrote. No one happens to have enough money at the end of the month to be truly generous. Extravagant generosity requires intentionality. Tithing results from a deep commitment, yes, but also from careful planning. We do it willingly and willfully, or we never do it at all. We have to think about it. We have to pray about it. We have to talk it over. It's a major decision involving everyone in a household. It requires us to change and to begin to seek God's priorities instead of merely our own priorities. A tithe is giving 10% of our income to God. Now, some people I know give 5% of their income to the church, and they take the other 5% and they share it with other groups that do important concerns. And uh, I would affirm such a practice as generous, as both generous and faithful. But Kathy and I have always chosen to give our tithe directly to the congregation that we're a part of. And if, uh, if, if 10% seems like too big a challenge for you right now, I have, a, I have a plan for you. I have a plan B. How's that? Figure out what percentage you're at right now. Total up what your income is. Take a look at the commitment you make. And figure out what percentage it is. And rejoice in that. See, tied again about money, it's about values, it's about what we love. And give it joyfully. And give it enthusiastically. Giving it, looking beyond the dollar to the value that we celebrate. And maybe challenge yourself to take a step every year. Go 1% or half a percent, whatever. It's not about the dollar, it's about the value. It's about what we love. Well, I got one more story to tell you, and I love to tell it because in the story, Kathy's the hero. <laughs> we got married relatively young in life, and after we were married, we worked at a church camp for a summer, and then in September, um, I was due to go back and start my job at the church where I was the youth minister. And I went back and I was going to finish my final year of college. And so it was Saturday night, and Kathy and I were sitting around the apartment. I think I was conjugating a Greek verb at the time. <laughs> and Kathy had the checkbook and the offering envelope. And the conversation went something like this. Kathy said to me, the church is going to pay you $35 a week to be the youth minister, right? And I said, yeah, that's sweet, isn't it? And then she said, I made $140 last week, including tips at Cayman's Coffee Shop. She was the cutest waitress at the coffee shop, by the way, then. Yep, you had a good week. And then Kathy said, okay, 140 plus 35 equals 70. And even I got that math right. And then Kathy said, a tithe is 10%, so I'm going to write a check for $17.50. And I said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathy wrote that check that night. It's one of the many ways you've enriched my life, dear. Thank you for your discipline and your faithfulness. I'd be lost without you. Kathy grew up in a Christian home. Kathy was nurtured in that discipline through her whole life. 
And I am so grateful. Well, a time is a gift of 10% shared with God, given in such a way that it doesn't leave our lives, but it becomes a part of affirming and building up that which we value most. Christian stewardship is about directing, directing human resources away from things that destroy life and toward those things that bring fulfillment of life. So let's all do all that we can. That the God we know in Jesus Christ might be made known to a hurting world, a frightened denomination, and anyone else in search of hope. Amen. Go now in peace, and may the love of God that we know in Jesus Christ animate you and sustain you. Grow in peace to love and to serve. Amen.